just to say hello and welcome to everyone that's joining today's webinar. We will get underway in just a minute or two. So welcome everybody. So welcome to everyone that's joining. Um, we'll get underway officially in just a moment or two. So I can see the numbers going up and up. So welcome to everyone that's joining. Okay, we'll maybe give it another 30 seconds and then we'll, uh, we'll get underway. I can still, still see people joining, which is great. So welcome on board, everybody. Okay, well, it looks like everybody's uh, managed to join now. We're, we're a minute past, so I think we should start. So let me again say uh, hello and welcome to everybody who has joined the webinar today. Uh, my name is Paul Lewis. I'm the Managing Director for Pittman Training, and I guess I'll be your host for the next 75 minutes or so. Um, so in a moment, I'll take you through the, uh, the housekeeping, the agenda, and we'll cover that off. Um, I just wanted to uh, just wanted to say good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on whereabouts in the world you're you're joining us from as well. We do have people from uh, all over the world joining us for today's webinar, which is fantastic. So let me go through the housekeeping. Welcome to everyone that's uh, still joining. Um, so first things first, we managed to uh, send out. Um, some instructions about downloading what's called Visual Studio Code. It's a free Microsoft download uh, that will come in really handy for the workshop in, uh, in a few minutes time. So well done to everyone who's already managed to download that. Um, if anybody uh, hasn't yet downloaded it, the link is already in the chat box. Um, it's on my screen as well, so you can copy it. Um, so if you could, while I'm talking through these next couple of slides, if you download that, it only takes a minute or two and you'll be ready for the workshop when we start creating code a bit later on. Uh, the webinar, as I mentioned, will run for 75 minutes, but uh, please stick with us right to the very end as well. We've got some important messages to share with everybody uh, before we go our separate ways at the end. So do stick around for those. Um, we will be using what's, what's called the Q&A feature within Zoom. So those of you that are already familiar with how Zoom webinars work, you'll already be familiar with this particular function. Um, you can see I just put on screen there on, on the right hand side, uh, you know, how the, the Q&A uh, function works. We want to make this webinar as interactive as we can. Obviously, with the numbers we have today, we can't take you off of mute or, or off of camera. But what we can do is take your questions through the Q&A function. So, um, by all means, familiarize yourself with that. And when, when we get underway, you can ask questions of either myself or, or of Eric when he takes over. And my esteemed colleagues who are uh, in the background, they will be monitoring the questions and trying to answer those as we go through. So do bear with them. If there's a really important one, uh, for example, if everyone's maybe uh, getting stuck on, on how to create a certain piece of code, then we'll throw that at Eric and he can come up with the answer. So that's how we're going to be interacting on, on one level. We are recording today's webinar and we can make that recording available afterwards. So if you want to watch it back or if maybe one of your friends or colleagues didn't manage to make it today, we can share it with them as well. Um, the other way we can interact is through the chat feature. I can see some people already using the chat feature. Um, so in fact, while I'm taking you through the next slide or two, um, why don't you jump on the chat feature, say hello, tell us where you're joining from. And what I'd really like to know is, is kind of what made you join today? You know, what is it you're looking to achieve over the next hour or so? We'd really love to hear from you. 
So anyone that's joined us in the last couple of minutes, uh, we've just done some basic introductions, but welcome and uh, thanks for joining us today. So I want to give you the overview of today's agenda. Um, before I do that, let me just lay down what, what is our objective, um, because we definitely want you to have some fun over the next hour or so. We definitely want you to learn the basics of how to code. That's really our headline objective. If you go away after today, knowing a little bit about how to code, and I guess what a day in the life of a web developer might look like, then I think that will be our mission accomplished. So that's our objective today. And we, like I say, we hope you enjoy your interactions with us today. So in a moment, I'll take you through some basic introductions. I'll position who are Pittman training and, uh, and what do we do? I can see lots and lots of people in the comments, which is fantastic. Looks like everyone has joined us from all different parts of uh, the UK, Ireland, Europe, and uh, I can see even some guests from Africa and the United States as well, which is fantastic. So welcome to everybody that's joined the webinar today. Um, the main, I guess, focus for today is the actual workshop itself, learning how to code. So I'm really, really excited about that. And I know you are too. So I'll introduce you to Eric Gross in a few moments time. Once we've had that workshop and we've kind of learned how to code, then we can start to talk about how we might be able to help you to break into a, a career in web development or software development. And we'll talk to you about some of the um, courses and some of the diplomas that you might want to look at to, to make that possible as well. We, if we have time at the end, we'll answer questions, but we'll try our best to answer them as we go. And then we'll take you through some, some next steps as well in terms of where we go from here. So without further ado, let me introduce Pittman Training. Who are we and, and what do we do? I guess our mission is to help people to gain the skills that employers are looking for. We're talking about, you know, job ready skills and recognized qualifications. You know, what is it that will make you stand out from the crowd when employers are looking to make appointments or to um, grow their workforce? We'd help people in a big way to change careers. Often you can end up in an industry or a sector that you, you, you know, you're, you're not enjoying anymore. So we help people to break out of their careers and completely change their, their career direction. Uh, we help people to improve their job prospects, gain promotions. Sometimes it is uh, a case of the person in the business with the, you know, the best skills or the most relevant skills wins that next promotion. So we're helping people a lot on that front. Um, we do this because we have flexible and self-paced um, training courses, and these are, are very, very much supported by our teams across, uh, across the whole of Pittman Training. Uh, we have wonderful training centres. In fact, we have 80 locations globally, um, most of which are in the UK and Ireland, so we can, uh, we can talk a bit about that later. Uh, we, we offer online learning as well, so you can, you can work from home, you can study from home, um, or you can you can do a blend of all of that. Uh, we have learning coaches in our, in our training centers that help you through the material and help you to, uh, to be successful. And in terms of learning methods, we have digital material, we have um, live software, we have video and audio, we have workbooks, we have assessments. So we have all different uh, methods and mediums of, of helping people to complete the, uh, the studies and complete the training material. And just some, I guess, areas that we cover that we support people in, uh, you can see on your screen there, um, IT, web and software development being, uh, you know, being a big one that we're talking about today. But we also talk about um, accounting and finance, Microsoft Office, secretarial roles, um, legal and medical administration, marketing, career development, the list goes on. Uh, we have over 40 diplomas here at Pittman Training. Uh, we have over 250 uh, training courses as well. Um, we support just over 10,000 students each year, which is something we're really proud of. And you can, you can see on the bottom of the screen some of the accreditations and some of the partnerships that we're proud to have. Um, and uh, the fact we, we have super brand status as well, which I think means uh, a lot of people may have heard of us because we've been around for 180 years. So we're pretty experienced in delivering training to, uh, uh, to these people. So I'd like to introduce in a moment, Eric Gross. Uh, Eric is uh, a legend in, in coding. He's had a uh, illustrious career in technology and programming and, 
and he's one of the founders, a co-founder for the Tech Academy. Um, so we're really, really delighted to have Eric on board. So what I am going to do is ask Eric to now introduce himself. Eric, I'll make you the host so you can take over the webinar from here on in. All right. Eric, am I making your whiteboard the host? No. I'm making you the host. Okay. Yeah. Just now. There we go. Over to you, sir. Well, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending upon what time zone you're in. Um, my name is Eric Gross. That was an amazing introduction. There's no way I can live up to that. Um, my wife would say that I'm only a legend in my own mind. But I have been coding for a long time, um, since I was a young, a young man, actually. And I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, I, I just want to jump right into it because I want to make this time as effective as possible for you all. So I'm going to share my screen and get going with um, a bit of our presentation. So give me just a moment here. And move this stuff out of the way. All right. So this is what we're going to talk about today is learning to code, what coding is. You're going to get your hands dirty and do some coding. And the, the primary reason that I really enjoy doing these things and, and the, the purpose I have in trying to help you is this, is I want to provide people an opportunity to find out whether or not they even like coding. Because let's face it, if you're going to jump on an endeavor as you know, challenging and you know, potentially rewarding um, and with as long a learning track as learning to code, learning to be a technology professional, you might want to know ahead of time whether the actual activity of coding or programming on a computer is something you enjoy, that, you, that you, you find interesting and challenging and exciting, or maybe something you'd rather never do again. So my hope would be that every one of you really enjoys what we do today, but the, the presentation we have today is for you. It's for you to find out whether or not this is a an activity, uh, a career path that you would potentially enjoy. So that's me. I co-founded the Tech Academy. We're a software developer boot camp. Um, we help people break into the technology industry. So this is our basic agenda today. We're going to do a quick little, intro little introduction. We're going to cover the basics of computers and programming in, in high-level terms, but hopefully we'll remove some of the mystery that might be there for some of you about what is a computer actually, these phenomenal machines that are changing the world and have been for decades, and what is programming? We talk about coding or programming all the time. What does it really mean in fundamental basic terms? Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a, an actual practical project that we're going to build, muck around with, and then we're going to build that project. You guys will actually do coding yourself. And that'll be the fun part. You're going to just dive in and actually write code on your computer. And you're going to be in control. You're going to run things. You're going to make things happen on your computer. Rather than just using a computer program someone else made, you get to make one. Then we'll have a Q&A at the end. And again, if there's anything that happens during the presentation that I'm doing, during our workshop, that requires some immediate attention, um, just go ahead and throw something in the chat, and we'll have people monitor, monitoring the chat. And if there's something I need to help with right away that's of a technical nature, then we'll take care of that. Um, the one thing I want to do right now, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, is this. There was some instructions sent out to all attendees to download a program called Visual Studio Code. And I want to show you what it looks like just on the off chance that there's someone out there that has not installed it. So what you're looking at right now is a program called Visual Studio Code. You can see that at the top here where it says Visual Studio Code. This is a code editor. You can write your code here, you know, like, um, like, okay, there's some code. Okay, that's super fancy. I know it's complex. But the point is that this is a tool you use to write your computer programs. And I wanna make sure everybody has this installed. So whether you're on a Windows machine or a Mac machine, it's gonna work just fine. But if you don't have a program called Visual Studio Code, and there you see the icon, at least on a Windows machine, um, the icon will be the same on a, on a Mac machine. If you don't have that, then please, while we're continuing through this before we hit the point where you're gonna need it, just Google download Visual Studio Code. 
you'll find the link. It's very simple and easy to, to, to locate. It's free. It won't hurt your computer. It's a phenomenal program. So if you don't have this installed, please do that now because we're going to need it in a little while. Eric, I put the link in the chat as well. Excellent. Thanks so much. All right. So let's get back to this. And move right into it. All right. So here's just some high level things I wanted to present before we dive into the practical element. Technology jobs around the world are plentiful and they're rewarding. Now, here's what I mean by plentiful. In every market or you know large regional area or state or country that I've ever taken the time to really look into, the number of available jobs in technology when compared to the number of available working professionals in technology is always greater. There are always more jobs than there are people. We have a talent problem in computer programming and technology jobs. And we have for a very long time. And frankly, I don't know that the available methods for breaking into the industry and becoming a working technology developer are gonna be able to keep up with it. Now, this is good news for you. It means that if you're a reasonably bright person and you can make it through technology training, particularly of the sort that Pittman provides, because it's a great program. I happen to know it inside and out. Um, if you can make it through that program and you're a decent person who likes working with, with, with others and collaborative you know, endeavor, you're always going to have a job. They're always out there. It doesn't mean it's super easy. You just walk into it, walk in the front door, and they give you a job. you got to work hard for it. But the point is the technology jobs are there, and they pay very well. In every market that I know of, they pay above the average, usually by a significant amount. Now, one of the challenges is it can be really hard to break into that industry. There's a lot of specialized knowledge you need to have to be a computer programmer. There's a lot of theoretical background regarding both computers and data structures and communication and that sort of thing. But then there's the practical elements of it, the actual day-to-day -day business of, you know, what tools do I use? What are the computer languages that are popular? What areas you know, have a long enough longevity in the industry that I should really concentrate on, on learning those? And it can take a fair bit to learn. There are three primary routes to breaking into this industry. Self-study, going to university, and boot camps. Now, what's really wonderful here is that what you have available to you at Pittman is a beautiful hybrid, actually. I'm going to get into that in a second. But if you look at these three routes, self-study is self-explanatory. It's just you find the resources, you set your agenda for what you're going to study, and you are your own um, headmaster. You run everything, right? Th there's a benefit there in that it's free and there's lots of resources available. But there's also a real danger in that it's very tough to know that you're studying all of the right things that are going to be used in the marketplace, that you haven't missed anything. And in particular, there's no way to find out what it's really like on the job when you do self-study. It's just a challenge. You can't replicate what it's like to be part of a working software development team when you're just studying in your, your living room. Then there's university, and university does an excellent job of really getting to the deep theoretical underpinnings of computer science, but they can sometimes lag behind the marketplace in terms of how current the technologies are that they're using, that they're teaching. And that's simply because it's so hard to change a university curriculum, but technology changes very quickly. And so you'll find that if you go to university um, you know, to learn computer science, you're gonna get a really good education, but all too often you find that the technologies that you're using, the languages, the tools are a little bit or a lot out of date. And so when you hit the, the job market, you've got to really rapidly come up to speed. Then there's boot camps, And what, we're, what we offer at Pittman is a, a version of a boot camp, a very, very good one. Boot camps are much shorter intensive periods of study of computer science and coding that concentrate on the practical elements of what you would need to, to be an actual working professional on the job right out of the gate as soon as you graduate. And they started about eight years ago in America and they've spread all over the world. And what Pittman does is really beautiful. They take the really excellent boot camp model 
that um, myself and my co-founder developed over the years, and they bookend on either side of it extremely valuable career education that just makes it that much – you're that much more valuable to an organization when you walk in the front door. You can code, and you can also just be an excellent employee and group member and collaborator and communicator. So that's enough of that. There's the hybrid solution. All right, so basics of computers. Let's jump into this. Coding, what is coding? Well, really it's you putting instructions into a computer instead of a computer telling you what to do or providing ways that you, that are predetermined, like you can only use the available options inside Microsoft Word, for example. Instead, coding is you putting the instructions in, you making the computer perform certain actions. So what's a computer? It's just a special type of machine. That's all it is. It's a machine like anything, other, anything else, any other machine you've used. So here's some really important truths about computers. They are only machines. They are not people. They can't think. They're not intelligent. They might as well be a lawnmower or a toaster or a refrigerator. They're just a machine. They were created by people. They can only act if a person tells them to act. And even then, they can only perform actions that a person thought of ahead of time and built into them. You can't take a lawnmower and make it fly. It's not built into it. If you wanted a flying lawnmower, one, you'd have to change the actual machine. Two, you'd probably get arrested. So these are computers. They're just machines. Now, they can be very complex or appear to be complex, and they can do so many things so fast, and we use them in so many aspects of our lives that they can seem rather intimidating. But trust me, under the hood, it's just metal and wires and plastic and moving parts and fans. There's nothing magic inside them. What are programs? Well, this is a series of written instructions that are entered into a computer, and those instructions control the computer. They run the computer. They cause the computer to perform a specific task, like making a certain text appear on the screen or accepting input from a keyboard or a mouse or you know, sending a communication to another computer. All these things computers can do, there's instructions available to you as a programmer that you can put into the computer to make them do those things. You do that using what are called programming languages. Now, language is just language. It's an organized system of words and phrases and symbols. When you talk about computers, these are words, phrases, and symbols that let you create programs. Again, to go back, that let you create a series of written instructions that can run the computer, that can make the computer do things. So that's programming languages, and there's lots of them. Now, here's the most important thing. There's a lot going on in this slide. And understanding what's happening on this slide can take away a lot of the mystery of computers. So just take a moment here and look at this. That first bullet point that says machine language, the actual instructions a computer can operate from is really important. Remember computers are just machines. They were created by mankind. And when the manufacturers go ahead and build a computer, they build into it a set of probably 15 to 20 actions that a computer can take. And these are the fundamental, simple, basic actions. Things like storing data in a certain location inside the computer, moving data from one location to another inside the computer, performing mathematical operations on the data in the computer, sending data to another computer, receiving data from another computer, accepting data from sort of some sort of input device, like a touch screen or a keyboard or a mouse, sending data to an output device, like the screen or a printer, that sort of thing. There's only a handful of these things that a computer can do, but it can do billions of them per second. So the computer can seem very magical and all powerful. But there's only a couple of dozen things that a computer can actually do. And those instructions are built into the computer in a form called machine language. 
Now, it looks like ones and zeros. What it really translates to, what it really is in the real world is patterns of electricity. If there's electricity present, that's a one. If there's no electricity present, that's a zero. And if you can take wires and make electricity travel on the wires, and if the electricity is there, you've got a one. If it isn't there, you've got a zero. And now you have a way to enter data into a computer with electricity or move data around inside a computer with electricity. Because again, remember, computers are just machines. They run on electricity. They have non-moving parts and moving parts. They're composed of things like metal and plastic and you know, fans and that sort of thing. It's just a machine. The language that the computer actually uses to operate off of, that tells it to do those things I mentioned, like reading in data, sending data to another computer, performing math operations, et cetera, that is called machine language. So the way programming works, and you can see it on the left of this graphic, is that you might write a you know, something that looks like English, display the word hello. That gets translated to machine language that the computer can understand. Because the computer can't understand display the word hello. But it can understand machine language, these instructions that are built into it. So when you translate display the word hello down to machine language, and then you pass that machine language into the computer to be executed or run or performed, the computer does what you tell it to if you've written it the right way, and it makes hello appear on the screen. And again, th this is what's happening when you're writing programs. You're writing it in what looks like English. You can see it on the left-hand side there, display the word hello. And you'll find when you start looking at computer languages, they're very readable. They're written in English-like. But what really happens is you write the instructions in an English-like language. They get converted to machine language, which the computer can operate. And then the computer does what it's told. Because again, it's just a machine. Now. Here's another really important concept. And this is gonna get close, we're getting closer and closer to um, the practical work that you're gonna do today. The difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. I'm gonna give everybody a moment to read these bullet points because I wanna have your attention. I want you to read this first. Okay, so everybody talks about the net or the internet. And so, oh yeah, I found it on the internet. Well, it's fine to say that in casual conversation, but as a technology professional, you'll learn very quickly that that's not really the internet. The internet is actually just machines. It's a network of computers. In other words, it's a, a bunch of computers around the world that have been connected whether they're connected with wires or sending radio signals or however they do it, connections have been established between, at this point, billions of computers. And because those computers have a common set of agreements for exchanging information back and forth, then the whole thing works. When one computer sends information like a health record, or a banking record, or a web page to another distant computer, both computers, if they agree on how to handle that information, then they can coordinate, they can work together. And again, remember, computers are only machines, so all of this would have had to have been set up ahead of time by human beings. But the work to do that was done decades ago. And now we, in fact, have a giant network of computers all around the world. And a bunch of smart people have gotten together and written down agreements about how to exchange various types of information, like health records, bank records, text information, web pages, just files, right? Electronic files. They've, they've figured out agreements on how to send that data back and forth. And now you have a thing called the internet. And again, it's just computers and agreements on how to send data or information, that's all it is. Now the web is the thing we use the internet for most. 
the web is just a collection of linked electronic documents. What's an electronic document? Man, you guys have made them. Every single person here has made an electronic document. Let me show you how simple it is to make an electronic document. Now, just think for a moment. We're on my computer. Here I am in Portland, Oregon. It's the computer. It works on electricity. It's an electronic machine. Watch this. If I bring up Notepad, which is on every Windows machine, and I type, this is some text, and I save that. Sample. I just made an electronic document. That's all it is. A document is just a written document with text in it. Alphanumeric characters, one, two, three, four, all the symbols at the top of the screen. This is just text. That is an electronic document. There's nothing fancy about it. It's a document you made on a machine called a computer. So now, Let's go back and continue here. So the web is a collection of linked electronic documents. That means if we go back here, it means that if you've got this electronic document called sample.txt and another document called eric.txt, if you found a way to link from one document to the next to have a connection between them, that's a linked electronic document. That's what the web is. It's just a system for connecting documents. Now, you can do so many amazing things with the web. You can go you know, e-commerce and shopping and playing games and you know, um, sending information you know, back and forth. There's a million things, but underneath all of it, it all starts with simple written documents. And you're going to create one of these documents today. And those documents can connect to other documents and they can be displayed on the screen in a program called a browser that you're all using right now, probably Chrome. So let's go back. There's a difference between the internet and the web. The internet is just machines. It's just connected computers. The web uses those computers to store documents. And those documents are linked together. That's what the web is. So now I'm going to show you how this works. And this is important to see the web in, in action because you're going to build your own web page today. So let me switch here. All right, so let's just take a moment here and look at some things. So if you've been following along so far, you've already gotten the idea that computers can connect to each other and can communicate. So let's look at a system where computers are connected and communicating with each other. And let's take an example of a computer. I'm gonna call this a PC for personal computer. It's not important whether the computer is made by, you know, Windows, you know, Mac, sorry, Microsoft or Apple or anything like that. It's just a computer, that's fine. And the person who owns this computer is our friend, Bob. And Bob, well, let's say he lives where I live in Portland. That's in Oregon, the northwestern part of America. So he's got his computer. Now, let's say Bob is a really big fan of a type of dog called a corgi. If you aren't familiar with corgis, you can Google them now. They're the cutest dogs in the world. And let's say that, let me reverse that. Let's say that Bob goes to the program he has called a browser. 
likely it's chrome or it's internet explorer if he really doesn't like his life or he might be on a mac machine a macintosh you know, an apple machine and have a browser called safari there's lots of different examples of browsers. We've all used one many, many, many times. A browser is just a program to request, receive, and then display web pages. And remember, the web pages are just linked electronic documents. That's all they are. So the way this works is this. in action. There's another distant computer. And let's say this computer is in London. This computer serves a very specialized function. It's called a web server. Its job is actually really simple. It sits there waiting for requests for web pages that it has stored in its files and folders. And when it receives a request, it sends the exact page that was requested, the exact electronic document. And again, electronic documents are just text documents. Ain't nothing fancy about them at all. Good, so that means that down inside, that's a folder symbol, because I'm not an artist you know, files and folders. There's folders on this computer, this web server computer, and they contain files. And those files are web page files. They are written in such a way that if they arrive to a browser, the browser can read through them and make something display on the screen. That's what they are. So the way it works is this. Bob goes to his browser and he says, please get me pets.com slash corgi dot html or similar. Probably just found a little link and he clicked on the link. Regardless, the browser gets data that looks like this. And there's a lot of information in here. We could spend hours breaking down how this works. The simple thing to, to think with is that this is a request. It's a request for a specific web page. That request, the browser is going to send it to this web server, this computer. It just literally sends a little teeny text document that says basically, hey, can you give me the electronic document called corgi.html? And someone made that document. They probably sat down at a computer just like you're using right now and typed it into like Notepad or a similar program. They made that document and then they saved it down in the folders on this computer. And now Bob in Portland has requested that exact file. It's just an electronic document. Nothing fancy about it. That request arrives at this web server computer. And then the computer finds the exact right file, which is called corgi.html, and it sends it back to Bob's computer. That is a response. That's all there is to the web. That's all it is. Now, there's a lot of technical details under the hood on how that works. And you'll learn all of those when you do your training. But at a high level, that's actually all it is. The browser as a computer program is directed to request a certain web page from a distant computer. That web page is just an electronic file. The web server computer finds the file, sends it back. The browser reads through that file and all the instructions on it. That file, which is written in a language called hypertext markup language, and you're going to make some of that today. You're going to make a file like this. The browser reads through this file, and because of the directions in it, makes a display on the computer 
Here's, this is somebody's monitor. Makes a really cool you know, display with articles and then pictures of corgis. I can't draw a dog to save my life. That's the best you're gonna get. So that's how it works. And you're going to do something like this on your computer. You're literally going to make the file that would be stored over on the web page or on a web server. And you're gonna use your browser to request that file and your browser will read through it and it will make something appear on the screen. You get to be in charge of that. Now we're gonna use a very simple example. The point of this training is to show you how the parts work and have you build them and control what your computer does instead of being at the effect of your computer. And along the way, you're gonna learn some stuff. So that's a little sketch of how the web works, the World Wide Web. Let's go back. And have me be the presenter. All right, let me share my screen again. All right, now we're going to start to narrow in on the practical work here. There's a little more data, okay? We talked about programming languages. One of the programming languages that's really popular around the world is JavaScript. Now, look at that first bullet point under JavaScript. Your browser interprets it and turns it into a machine language. Now, it may, it may seem like I took a little bit of a left turn here, but just go back for a moment and remember this diagram. You write a command on the, left, on the left there, going from the left to right. You write a command in a language that looks like English. It gets translated to machine language that the computer can understand. That machine language gets passed to the computer for execution, and the computer does what those instructions tell it to. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a language that you would write the print hello on the screen that would get interpreted and converted down into machine language. And the computer would do what you wrote. There's an example right down there that is in fact written in this language called JavaScript. If age greater than 18, then do an alert. An alert, and you've experienced this all the time if you've you know, been on the web, is a, a pop-up at the top of your screen that has a message in it. That's it. So you guys can read this code. This is code right in front of you. And you can probably figure out on your own what it means. It means if a particular person's age is above 18, then print a message at the top of the browser that says, hey, you may purchase these cigars. This is the code that you'll write. This is type an example of code. Now, another quick thing. We're not gonna spend a bunch of time on this. The concept of an algorithm. It's a plan for solving a problem. This is, this is where we get into the idea of thinking like a computer. Computers do one thing at a time and they do them in an exact order. This is an example. Pick a shirt from your closet, put the shirt on, look at yourself in the mirror. If you like the shirt, go to step six where you end everything. Well, you end this procedure. If you don't like it, go back to step two. Should actually say step one. That's fun. I found an error in the algorithm. You get the idea though. It's a sequential one after another set of instructions to solve a problem. Here the problem is I want to walk out the front door with a nice shirt on. So that's a silly example. In computers, you're going to use algorithms for things like, you know, processing a bunch of data and finding out what the average, say, sales price is for certain items, or you know, um, high and low temperatures, or which student needs to have their grade schedule you know, um, examined next, whatever it is you need to solve, you will write an algorithm for it as a programmer. All right, now, we've covered this concept already in that sketch. This is the language you're gonna use today, hypertext markup language. You're gonna write instructions in a text document. And the instructions are what make content appear on your screen when you use the browser. 
This is the language that makes things appear on the screen. And this language controls the appearance of content, not the content itself. How do you do that? You take content. And what is content? Content is just words and pictures. That's all it is. Words, pictures, videos, charts. That's content. And you take the content and you surround it by what are called tags. Take a look at that example where it says the fifth word is, and then there's a funny symbol. And then there's the word italicized and another funny symbol in this sentence. What you're doing is you're telling your browser, hey, listen, display, this, display the words, the fifth word is italicized in this sentence, display those to the screen. But when you get to the word italicized, I want you to do something different with the appearance of those words. I want you to make anything inside those little markers, they're called tags, make them in fact italicized. And you can see below that what gets displayed. So this is one of the central concepts to think with when you're thinking about the web. The web is all about content, articles, videos, charts, diagrams, pictures, all of it. And they all get thrown up on the screen in a certain way. So as a programmer, one of the things you learn about is controlling the appearance of that content. You may not write the content. You might have at your com company, for example, a copywriter who writes all of the, the content or makes all of your videos or all of your diagrams. You're less concerned with that as a programmer. You're more concerned with how does it look when it appears on the screen? And what happens if someone is only on a tiny little mobile device and the next person is on, you know, they have a huge 40 inch monitor how do I make sure that the appearance looks good and works right for all the different ways people can view web pages? Good. So here's the important concept because you're going to be writing this in a moment. Look at that word italicized where it's got weird symbols before and after. Those weird symbols are called tags. But more precisely, notice that they're slightly different. The one before the word italicized just has less than, I, greater than. But the one after throws a slash in there. There's a slight difference between these two tags. One is an opening tag. That's the first one. And the other is a closing tag. It's just a way for the browser to know when to start making content appear a certain way and when they should stop making it appear a certain way. So if you look at the whole thing there of the opening tag, the just the letter I, and the closing tag, it's got a slash and then the I, and then the content in between them, that whole thing is called an element. An element is one part of an overall whole. And in this case, the overall whole is the web page. It's one element on the web page. All right. We're not going to get too deep into this, but there's another concept called ca cascading style sheets. They let you apply style rules, what colors, what fonts, you know, what borders for all of your content. And for a large website, it's neat because you can control those rules across many web pages from one location, from one little file. Here's an example. There's an element. Remember elements? That's the opening and closing tags plus the content. One element is called a paragraph element. The code you see on the screen, this cascading style sheets code, literally means that for every element on every page that uses this little cascading style sheets uh, rule, make all the paragraphs the color red, all of the text will be red. And you can literally change it to green in this one location and every single web page on your entire website, all the paragraphs would suddenly become green. So it makes you have a lot more control over your website. And we're not gonna go too deep into that. I just want you to know about it. Now, we're just gonna start building a project. Let me show you an example of a project that I've built. And Let's 
search a little bit. All right. Now, recall the sketch. And the sketch I have no, that I wrote, there's a request by a browser for a specific exact web page, a specific file. I'm finding that file right now. Now look at that. Look at that file for a moment, guys. Notice that the um, file extension, these letters after the dot, is HTML, hypertext markup language, what we were just discussing. When I made this file and I saved it to my computer, I literally wrote the name of the file as index.html because I know that the, the text inside this file, which I'm gonna show you right now, Let's look inside that file. There's the text. Now, don't worry about all those instructions. We're going to look at that stuff in a moment. But that's all that's in there. It's just te text. And in fact, instead of it being all pretty with nice colors and everything, which you'll learn about in a moment, let's just look at it in a very simple editor. See that one? Let's just go. I want an even simple editor. I want you to see that all this is, is just text. So let's do open with and I'm going to find notepad. There it is. This simple text editor built into every Windows machine for the last 25 years. Now look at that. The reason I want you to see this is because if you look at this version right here, there's all kinds of fancy color, you know, to all this, this text. And there's a bunch of stuff going on with the rest of this computer program called Visual Studio Code. And it can be a confusing mess. I want you to understand the simplicity of it. This file called index.html that we're about to see con, you know, in the browser is going to control the appearance of a browser uh, window. It's just text. I wrote this. There's nothing special about it. It's just text. Now, the text is written in a language called hypertext markup language, which the browser can use. But it's just text. So let's keep that there for a minute. Let's look what happens when we go back to that file and we actually open it in the browser. You can do that by just double clicking on it because the browser on my computer, which is Chrome, knows that it's the, the program is supposed to use this file. So I double click, look at that, that's a web page. It's in my browser, this is my Chrome browser. I just did that activity that I sketched where I put in a request for a certain web page. That web page, which you can see here, is just text. That text was delivered to the browser. The browser read through it and then displayed, made a display on the screen. And you can see little bits of like stuff in here. Like, look at this title. Hey, well, so, like this is weird. Like, what is that? Well, look, that appears up there. Look over here, it says demo of simple web page. Well, it says demo of simple web page right there. And it even says some kind of click me thing. If I click on it, some more text appears. All that stuff is in here in text. We get to write some. All right, so that's enough of that. Let's do the actual work here. Here's what I want everyone to do. I want you to open up Visual Studio Code Hey, Eric, Paul Lewis, just um, a, a bit of a time check for you. So we have about 20 minutes left. So if you can do sort of 10 to 15, is that okay? Yep. Totally you, fine. Cool. You're going to see in the next 10, 15 minutes, everything we just talked about come together. And it's fun. So follow along. When you have a web page, you have to say,
that says exclamation point doc type. Then it's HTML. Eric, our participants should be typing this themselves as well. Absolutely. Right? Start coding, guys. Literally just <laughs> open up Visual Studio Code, do file, new file, right there, and just start typing. Oh, good. So now you want to designate the beginning and the end of where all your content's going to be. So you do an HTML tag and then a closing HTML tag at the bottom here. Now, the most important thing here is the body. This is where you put your content. And try to keep this really simple. Leave this on the screen for a moment. And let's put some body work, some content here. This is Eric's content. Now, don't write Eric because your name isn't Eric, or maybe it is. So I'm going to leave this on the screen for a moment. I want everybody to get caught up. Make sure you're typing every character. The exclamation point here. Remember that your, your slashes, you know, the backspace, you know, back, backslash or forward slash, actually. And you can type whatever you want here. Okay. Now, I'm going to go through this next thing a couple of times. So if you get lost, that's all right. Just bear with us. Right now, this is a text document, and it's not saved to your computer. You want to save it to your computer and then open it with your browser. So file, save, and you decide where it's going to go. I'm putting mine in my documents folder, and I'm going to put it down here under personal. And I am going to give it a name. Now, it's common for the main page of every website to be called index.html. You can call it foo.html. Or you can call it eric.html. Doesn't matter what you call it. Make sure it has .html so we know that it's hypertext markup language. So let's use the convention index.html. I'm going to leave that there for a moment before I hit save. Index.html. Now, when I save this, remember where you saved it. We want to go back to it in a moment. Remember where it is. Then click save. Visual Studio Code now knows that this is HTML. You can even see it down here. It was text before. Now, it's, it knows we're writing HTML, and it's very helpful. It color codes things so it's easier to see the structure of what you're building. But I want to see this in the browser now. I just wrote a web page. And if you're following along, you just wrote a web page. There's not very much to it, but it's your web page and you made it. Let's open it. Go to your file explorer and find that file. I was in documents, personal, and it was called index.html there it is you can even see the date 1118 it's 857 for me find your file and double click it now i'm going to go through that again you're in visual studio code you've written out this text you go file and then save. When you save it, remember where you're going to save it and call it index.html. Then find the file using your file explorer. If you've named it properly, it should have a special like symbol before it for whatever your default browser is. Chrome, Internet Explorer, Safari, whatever. 
double click it, and it should open a new tab in your browser that shows your content that's there. All right, so if you've successfully done this so far, you have made a web page. You should feel happy about that. There's a lot more you can do with this, but you just made that system that I sketched out work. You requested a specific page by using the browser. Now, you did it in a weird way. You had to double click on the file, but it still opens the browser program and tells the browser to go to this exact file. You can see it up here. It says, hey, go to this file, index.html, read through it, and then control the display on the web page according to what's in that file. And what's in that file is simple. It's just this content. So now let's add another thing. Remember that when you go to web pages, a lot of the time, there's this hover over text like this. That's called a title. Now, we put all of our content in between these body tags. But there's another type of tag called head. Notice it's after the HTML. It's after HTML, but before body. Let me even give a couple of spaces to make that very clear what's going on. You want an opening and closing head tag. In here, there's another element you can tab over if you want to. Call the title element. This is where you put the thing that appears when you hover over the tab or it's written there. So uh, we're going to call this fun with code. You may need to save to change the file. Because remember, the file is what the browser is going to read. But if you go back to the browser right now and hit this reload, it'll go get the page again which has changed, and you should have a title up here. So I'm going to do click reload. And now if I roll over this, look, I have a title, fun with code, which is exactly what I coded right here, fun with code. Now we want to have a little bit more content on here. I actually want a paragraph in here. P is a paragraph tag. Paragraphs mean you have space above and below them. So there should be space above this. Write that. Again, it's just the P and then slash P. That's all it is. And it's got to be inside the body tags. Now, if you then go save, go back to your web page and refresh it. Look, there's a space above that. And there's space below it too. Good. So I want to take a moment here as the instructor and just look in here at the chat. Is there anything that people are bumping into that I can help with? Oh, Daniel, great question. Is JavaScripting able to be altered? Absolutely. So let's do one final demonstration here. So what do I have on my web page right now? Well, there's not a lot going on. There's one single line of text and there's a paragraph, if you want to call it a paragraph, with space of it. In fact, I just want that to be fleshed out a little bit more. So in here, I'm just going to put a bunch of content. Doesn't matter what it is. You want it to be quite long. Just type, just keep on going, guys. Go way out there. 
And then when you've just thrown a bunch of characters on the keyboard, hit save. Again, to go back, all I did was go right after my text here, and I just kept rolling. Now when I go back and hit reload, now it looks like I have a paragraph of some sort. Okay, good. Oh, and Google Translate thinks it's Norwegian. That's hilarious. It's not Norwegian. It's Eric attacking the keyboard. Good. So here's the last thing I want to show you is, can I make it so that when I click on a word, that a message pops up at the top? Let's do that. Let's just have a single word sitting here. Now, you're going to want this word to be inside an opening and closing tag. One of the most common tags you can use is a div. It just means a division. So type that out. It's just a separate element on a page. It's, it's a way of organizing the content on your page. I want a div in here. And what I want in here is the word, uh, two words, click me. Except don't spell it all old English, spell it correctly. So that's simple. Now, can anyone tell me when we go back? I know you're not gonna, I just want you to think about this. I've got hundreds of students, but just think about this. Is there gonna be space above the word click me and before the paragraph? Let's look. And by the way, the reason I'm not hitting save every time is I have a little option here called auto save checked. It's just a nice thing Visual Studio Code lets you do. So it just saves every single time I make any change. So let's go back here and if I reload, look at that, there is space above the word click me because the paragraph element forces space above and below. All right, good, so here I am. I've successfully made a web page. Yeah, there's nothing fancy to it, but it's a web page and I made it and I'm reading it with my browser. What I wanna have happen now is that I want this text, if I click on any of the text here, click me for a, a, something to pop up. And this is where JavaScript comes in. Right now, all you're dealing with is static content. There's no interaction with the user. There's no way of changing what's going on. But let's change that. Right here, I want you to pay very close attention to where I put the cursor. I'm after the word V, but before the word, or the, the symbol greater than. See how I hit some spaces there and you can see where I am? And now you're gonna use a JavaScript instruction on click. Write that, on click. And this just uses JavaScript to control what happens when someone clicks on the content. So equals, and then inside of quotes here, do double quotes. And now we're gonna provide some JavaScript code. Alert, and, and open parentheses. Now pay attention, it's a single quote like that. That's a single quote, not a double quote. And inside there say, this is in an alert. Go after the single quote. Do your end parentheses and then do a semicolon. Now I'm going to leave that on the screen for a couple of minutes here. What this is saying to the browser is, hey, go ahead and display the words click me, but also pay attention to those words, the words that are inside this div. And when someone clicks on those words, run the following JavaScript. And the JavaScript is pop up an alert. Let's see if it works. And I'll come back to it. First of all, you have to refresh or reload to get that new page into the browser. So reload. 
And if I click on it, look at that. An alert pops up. I'll show you that again. The whole sequence. We made this div that had the words click me. Inside the opening element, before this you know, greater than symbol, I wrote some JavaScript. I said, on click, run this JavaScript code. And it works. A person can go out here. Look, if I click on this, I'm clicking, nothing happens. It might highlight it a little bit, but nothing occurs. But when I click on this, JavaScript code runs and it controlled what my computer did. It controlled the browser. I'm sure all of you have seen these little alerts pop up before. Well, you get to control whether or not that happens from your web page, and you do it using JavaScript. So, one last word. There's a lot of things you can do on a web page. All I've shown you here is simple things, like can I set a title for the web page? Can I make some content that isn't controlled in some way? Or can I make some content that is controlled, in this case, by a paragraph tag? Can I make some content that a user can interact with? And when they interact with it in some way by hovering over it or clicking on it, that something will occur. Those are the tools you use to make these super complex, really awesome web pages. Underneath it all, this is all that's happening. This is also how you make images appear. There's a tag called image. And inside the image, this is where you point to where the, the image is. Like literally, you point to a file on the computer that's an image file, a JPEG or a PNG. There's nothing complex about it. Again, remember, even though it's all pretty colors, what you're looking at is just text. To go back to the idea of the notepad thing, it's just text. It sure looks pretty inside of Visual Studio Code, but that's just for readability purposes. For you as a computer programmer, to more easily, quickly at a glance see what's going on, but it's just text. And when that text file gets sent to a browser, the browser can read through the text file and control the appearance and behavior this click thing is a behavior. It can control the appearance and behavior of your web page. Now, this is a very simple example, totally understood. But I want you to see that underneath the hood, computer programming is composed of, the, acti the activity is using individual, easily understood tools to do one tiny bit of work at a time the overall product can be a very complex web page or very complex computer program, but they are built one piece at a time and you can understand each one of those small pieces and learn how to put them together into a beautiful, well-performing web page or a nicely laid out, very well-performing computer program. You can learn these things. Yes, there's a lot to learn. But when you learn it in the right order, mastering each small piece before you move on to the next one, you arrive at the end of that journey really capable and really certain that you are the one that can control the computer and that you can make a computer do things to help other people. E-commerce functions excellent websites, productivity software that lets people work in spreadsheets, software that lets people maintain records of all of their inventory or all of their employees or all of their students and, mo and, and monitor and track things. You can make these things and you can be of great value to people and to businesses and you can get paid really well for it. So that's the end of it. I understand that some of you may not be able to follow along with every single bit of it, okay? I'm gonna go back to the code here, just for a moment. Take that part away. 
I just want you all to see that because many of you may, may very well be able to um, view the recording. And this is a spot where you can see the finished product. That's all there is going on. We made a file called index.html. In it, we put, well, this is the type of document it is. Here's where my HTML begins and ends. Here's where my head information begins and ends. And there's a title in there. Here's where my body information, the, bot, the content body begins and ends. And all I've got in here is three things. Content that is not modified. A paragraph of content with space above and below it. And a, a, a div, an element on the page that displays a little bit of text, but then tells the browser to watch that text and do something special if someone clicks on the text. That's all there is to the web page. Good. Now, let me, I'm going to keep on sharing because if people have questions during the Q&A that relate to uh, the, the content, I want to show them. But I want to turn this back over at this point. Who wants to run this now? Hey, Eric, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, Paul Lewis here, just to, uh, yeah, just to say that was fantastic. We've had lots and lots of questions and comments throughout. We've maybe pushed a few over to you, but um, we just wanted to, I guess, kind of bring it back to how, you know, how we can help, how, how Pittman training can help. We've had a lot of um, comments on the chat where people are saying, the reason I've come to the webinar today is because I would like to make, uh, you know, my own career in, in uh, web development, but I don't know how. So I think you've covered a lot of that and, and talked about how the industry is in such high demand right now and, and the big rewards that go with some of those, those jobs as well. So um, the next couple of slides that I, I wanted to share. So if, um, if we can swap screens in, in just a second, um, yep. we just talk about the diplomas that you've helped us to, to create, uh, which a number of uh, Pittman students are working through currently. Uh, thank you very much. So I'll try and share my screen one second. So Eric, I might need you to make me the host if that's okay. Yep, just a moment. Thank you, sir. Come on. Oh, I have two of them on here for you. That's why there it is. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where the other Paul Lewis came from. Um, <laughs> Famous artist. Yeah, there's too too many of us. Um, so bear with me just a moment, everybody. Thank you for uh, for surviving this far. So, Eric, you can uh, you can see my screen there. Yes. Yep. Excellent. So uh, let me just click on from there. Yeah, definitely feel like I've learned something today. That's uh, I think you've demystified uh, coding. You know, I, I wouldn't have thought it was that simple to 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 start out with coding. So that's been you know really excellent. Um, so, Eric, you helped us, uh, I guess, uh, a year or two ago to develop these, uh, you know, these fantastic diplomas, kind of born out of your um, your experience, but born out of your work, your boot camps as well. So, um, I've just put on the screen there the, the sort of very uh, brief overview as to what one of our diplomas we call it the the web development. This is a good entry level for people who uh, you know who you can see on the screen there. Two hundred and thirty two hours is what it would take end to end, and the um, the hexagons there are examples about the sort of roles. If you've you know looked online or you've 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 looked out at uh, jobs available, you know these are the sorts of um, jobs that this would set you up for. Would that be a fair comment, Eric? Um, yeah, absolutely. And what's neat is that um, we've covered those technologies in a little bit of detail, you know, in some sort of detail today. So you can see that this, the basic tools, techno technologies you use as a web developer, under the hood, they're actually really simple. Yeah, you can, there's a lot to learn, but know that the HTML is a simple technology. Yeah. JavaScript is, a, is actually a relatively simple technology. And when you get through the program, yeah, those are the types of jobs you can get. Yeah, yeah, I was reading just yesterday that the um, kind of web developer market, if if you will, is set to grow another 18% over the next 10 years, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when other job roles and industries are actually shrinking, uh, web development is, uh, you know, is growing at such a rate as it has done, I guess, for, you know, more than a couple of decades, but uh, yeah. it's going to keep on, keep on growing, which is, and as you say, um, it outperforms most other industries in terms of, uh, 
earning expectations as well. Um, so that's our, I guess, entry level web development diploma. And I just wanted to show you the, the other one that Eric has helped to, to develop as well. Uh, it's got the word advanced in front of it, advanced software and web develop, development diploma. So this one opens up even more, um, I guess, specialized job job roles. So how would you describe this one, Eric, in terms of, you know, how, because this, this is almost twice the length of time that it would take someone to study, but it would set them up for some even, I guess, even bigger careers, right? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna describe a concept to everybody. Please pay close attention. A computer program will almost always want to be able to store data for future use. Whether it's you know sales records, accounting records, inventory records, it wants to store those to be able to be recalled later on. And it uses a technology called a database to do that. Database is, sounds fancy. It's just stored electronic data. That's all it is. And it can be stored in a lot of forms. Now, remember the sketch that I showed. The browser sends requests down to the web server. The web server very often will need to reach out to a database to grab some of that historical data and use it in creating the actual web page is going to send back to the browser. If you've requested a list of all students with the last name Smith, the web server is going to have to reach out to the database and ask for all of the students with the last name of Smith. And then the web server programming that you would create will customize the web page to be sent back so that in the user's browser, they see all the users that have the last name Smith. That system of the browser communicating with the server and the server communicating with the database and then all the way back through to the browser again is called a full stack. If you think, think of these things stacked one on the other, what you get out of this program is you are a full stack developer. You can do all the work needed to make the browser do its job, to have the web server handle the requests and customization that it needs to for web pages. And you can work with the database to make it store electronic data, change that data, retrieve the data as needed. You are much more valuable on the job market at that point because you can work on any aspect of a computer program. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. And, and we were talking just before the, uh, the webinar as well, that these, these two diplomas have been deliberately designed side by side. So yep. um, if somebody wanted to come in on the um, entry level, the web development diploma, and then decided that, you know what, I want to go even further now that I've done that amount of study, they can transition to the advanced. Um, so that, that's easy for, for people to do. And I guess it's important to say as well that um, uh, you don't have to have prior experience to take these uh, these particular diplomas, uh, you know. So, would you agree, Eric? If you've got zero experience, that you could you could take the study and you could survive it and get through it. Yeah, and we've seen that over the last eight years. We worked very very hard to break the subject down for the student, instead of the subject itself breaking the student. It's the other way around. So yes, if you're a reasonably right person who is willing to work hard and can do basic math and read and write, you can get through this program. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to pick up on, on a couple of things you said early on, Eric. Um, and just for everyone's benefit, you know, we're sort of two or three minutes from wrapping up now. So if you've got um, somewhere to go, then we're, we're, we're not far from the end. Um, but you said at the beginning about, you know, university or college or, or different forms and, and different types of, uh, um, you know, study options. And um, Pittman Training, we're offering um, a self-paced diploma. So we put on the screen a moment ago, it could take 200 hours, it could take four or 500 hours for the advanced. Um, but it's for you to fit around your, your life and your schedule. So if you've got uh, full-time jobs or a business or you've got children or busy lives, um, you juggle this and you run the courses at your pace and totally supported by our training centers. So we have training centers up and down the UK and uh, uh, across the globe as well. Um, we have our learning coaches. So these, uh, you know, these are, are on hand in all of our centers around the clock with questions and you know, I guess, um, situations that uh, you need their help. But we've also got 
Eric and, and his fabulous team at the Tech Academy when questions start to get really complex. So you feature in the diplomas as well. That's right, Eric. Absolutely. One of the th and by the way, in today's purely virtual world, we're very happy about the fact that we started delivering all of our training programs online back in 2014. So we're very skilled at helping remote students and have been for years. So with the unfortunate you know, situation we all have right now, the good news is if you're doing our training, you can excel, you'll get support, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. No, I uh, thank you for that, Eric. I just want to sort of summarize now, while we're just doing that, if I shout out to my colleagues who are in the background, are there any burning questions or anything that uh, we wanted to put in front of Eric before we bring the webinar to a close? By all means, just interrupt us and throw the question on board and we can we can tackle that. Paul, I think we've been able to respond mostly directly to to questioners throughout. I, I don't see anything that needs to be uh, shared broader, more broadly to the group. Yeah, OK. And I saw in your, your comments there, Robert, throughout, you were reminding people that we're sharing today's presentation. Uh, we're sharing the recording, the video recording as well. So if you uh, maybe fell behind in some of the demos that uh, Eric was giving there, um, you can run back through it again at your leisure. So Visual Studio Code is a great little tool that you can, you know, free to download. So you can have a play. I'm already thinking, you know, with my uh, uh, my children, I'm probably going to, uh, you know, do a mini boot camp and see if I've actually remem remembered what I've learned today and see if they can keep up as well. So excellent. Um, hope, hope you've enjoyed today, guys. Uh, that was our one of our main objectives. Hope you've learned something as well. You've had a taste of uh, coding and, and uh, you know, we owe, we owe thanks to Eric today uh, joining us from uh, quite literally the other side of the world. Um, if you are thinking, look, I want to explore a, a career in coding a bit further, I just don't know where to go or, or who to speak to, come and have a chat with us. Um, we will be sending um, a thank you email. So there'll be some uh, suggestions in there in terms of if you want a, uh, I guess a career consultation with one of our course advisors, we can arrange that via Zoom or when time allows, you can come along and have a coffee with our, our teams and talk about how we can help you to springboard your career uh, with, um, you know, with the help of, of Pittman training. Do jump on our website as well. It's a great resource. The diplomas and the courses that we sort of touched on today are mentioned there as well. Um, and I, I should say as well, we've got um, over 250 training courses. So if you're thinking, do you know what, actually um, coding wasn't for me or isn't for me, but I want to learn something else, maybe a different IT program or even, you know, something completely, um, you know, left field. We've got courses and diplomas for absolutely everybody and absolutely every subject. So uh, check out our website. If something's of interest, you know, click the inquiry button, get in touch, and we'd love to talk to you. Um, as it says on the screen there as well, um, you know, you can easily spread the cost of, uh, of the training. So it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, we've got flexible payment options for everybody. So uh, yeah, that's it from us really. Eric, any final words, any final thoughts from you, sir? I just really appreciate all the attendees for taking their time out of their day to do this. And I, I really hope you take a solid look at this. It's, it's such a satisfying work. Coding and software development is such a social, collaborative human activity, even though it seems dry and you're working with machines. And if you found any interest in this, just communicate with the folks at, at, at Pittman. It might very well be worth your while and change, honestly, change your life. Eric, thank you so much. So yeah, just to echo that, thank you to everybody that stayed with us. I think almost every one of our participants has hung on till the end, which is fantastic. That tells us that there's uh, a, a bit of interest there, which is great. And uh, thank you to my colleagues in the background for helping to uh, make the, uh, the webinar run well and answer all those questions as well. Any outstanding questions, we'll, we'll try and answer afterwards. Um, but look, goodbye. Thank you for joining. And uh, we hope to speak to you in the near future. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, all. Bye for now.